proponent of, of uh, individual rights, how do you feel about slavery, sir? A penetrating question. The gentleman wishes to know, uh, I suppose, partly because I'm rather well known for a particular statement that I made four years ago, that of liberty or death. What are my views upon the institution of slavery? I believe that it might be proper for me, sir, to recite for you some words that I wrote in a letter uh, just uh, six years ago, back in 17 and 73. Writing it to a Quaker man, a man by the name of Pleasance, Robert Pleasance. He's a planter on the James, quite near Richmond Town. <coughs> and now, as you know, for about the last 25 or 30 years, the Society of Friends, the Quakers, have been very vigorously promoting the immediate abolition of the institution of slavery, believing that it can be done very simply. In a day's time, they've been writing a number of religious tracts and pamphlets to this end. And Mr. Pamphlet, or Mr. Um, uh, Pleasance had sent to me a number of these pamphlets, and in thanking him for his kindness and acknowledging receipt, I wrote these following words, which I believe rather clearly reflect my own personal turmoil. Uh, with regard to, uh, to the, the holding of a, of a particular race in bondage. And I quote, Dear Sir, I have been ever deeply troubled and much bewildered that those who style themselves as Christians, Christianity which after all softens the human heart, which cherishes and improves its finer feelings, should not only recognize but would encourage a system, that of slavery, which I find to be repugnant to the first impression of right and wrong. What adds to my amazement is that it was introduced into this country in the first place, this being more fond of liberty than any other, and during these enlightened ages too, which seem at least to boast of high improvements made in not only the arts and sciences, but of refined morality. Every honest thinking man must reject the system of slavery in speculation. But alas, how few in practice. Would anyone believe that I am myself the master of slaves of my own purchase? It is with considerable shame that I confess to you, sir, that I am drawn along to the practice of owning slaves by the general inconvenience of living without them in this life. For my own part, I cannot justify it. I will not. <clears throat> Later in the letter, I continue thus. And I am certain that that happy day will come in the future of our country, meaning Virginia, when we shall be freed from our complete and utter dependence upon the labor of these hapless wretches. At the same time, however, sir, I am a reasonable man, and I know that it will not occur within our own lifetimes. For as slavery was introduced into this country by bits and measures, so must it also end. But we must allow the system of slavery to wither and die as would a gourd upon the vine. It is destructive to our liberty, our happiness, and our prosperity. End quote. The two commonest means for gentlemen in this enlightened age of, of the 18th century to justify the owning of slaves as we ourselves struggle against slavery uh, are, are really two. One of them religious in nature and one of them more legal or political. The first being this. Who can deny that Almighty God makes us each and every one? It is he who puts us here on this earth with a purpose. It's not necessarily going to be the case that we're ever going to know God's purpose for us, for us, but he puts some of us here to be masters and some of us here to be slaves. And who are we to question the wisdom of God? A second argument more frequently used is more political in nature. And that is this, that the laws of men the laws of nations, for these 6,000 years nearly since this earth was created by Almighty God, have all recognized one fundamental principle. To wit, a conquered people surrenders its rights and liberties unto the conquering power. There you see, we're justified in this struggle for liberty against Great Britain because we are not a conquered people. Rather, we're the descendants of the British conquerors. No power on this earth, therefore, can strip away from us our God-given rights to life, liberty, and property. Our slaves, on the other hand, are a conquered people. Conquered at first by other African princes, and then later by European powers, most notably the Dutch and the Portuguese. And thus, at the time of that conquest, in the eyes of the law, our slaves were no longer men with rights. 
they became instead property. And therein lies the greatest entanglement to the Quaker scheme of abolishing slavery by simply enacting laws forbidding the owning of slaves. Because that would be your government depriving you of your property. Your government cannot do that unless, of course, in the case of eminent domain, they justly compensate you for that seized property. I regret to say, friends, that with nearly half our population in Virginia being slaves, that much money for compensation to the masters does not exist. Furthermore, let's not forget we're an agricultural society. We grow tobacco, wheat, corn, peas, flax, hemp, timber is abundant. We supply one-seventh, here in Virginia, one-seventh of the known world's iron supply. All of these exports of ours, your livelihoods, gentlemen, all require constant attention. Alas, there do not exist any engines or machines which can supply that sort of labor. And we furthermore don't have the happiness in Virginia, as they do points northward, of a large free labor force. That, by that I mean uh, young bucks who own nothing yet themselves and who are therefore pleased and eager to work for wages for other men. Here in Virginia, land is so inexpensive. Three days to the west of here, you can still purchase rich fertile land for a penny an acre that anyone who wants to own their own farm rather easily may. Most choose to do so. And so therefore, they work for themselves, not for others. In this way, for 150 years now, well, 120 years, we have inherited a complete and utter dependence upon the labor of our slaves. And at the same time, they have developed a complete and utter dependence upon us for their very subsistence. Remember, as slaves are property here in Virginia, they're generally well maintained. This is not the Sugar Islands, friend, where a slave will live between three and seven years and no more. This is Virginia. We take care of our Negroes. They are fed, clothed, sheltered, nursed when sick, educated, they're skilled, uh, they're, there are laws protecting them. If all of a sudden, these poor wretches were freed by some miracle, what would become of the greatest number of them? Misery! They wouldn't be able to provide for themselves. It's our duty to look after them. And so, we've come to the belief now, though, that not only is slavery repugnant to the first impression of right and wrong, it's becoming more dangerous every day. Consider. Recent reports have it that the Negro population here in Virginia is increasing at a faster rate than is that of the white free. Consider my plantation, for example, Scotchtown. My nearest neighbor is seven miles away from me. At any given time, there might be 12 to 15 members of my family, my overseer, etc., at my plantation. I own 30 Negroes. That's a ratio of roughly two to one, slave to free. I'm shaved each morning by my trusted manservant with a sharp razor close at my neck. Our food is prepared by a Negro's cook who can easily poison it. In most cases, our house servants sleep on a pallet on the floor right beside our beds. How well do you think we sleep at night, especially after the Dunmore Proclamation and then the Phillipsburg Proclamation, which just, which in effect was the same, the same idea, that the British were going to free our Negroes if they ran away and took up arms against them, against us. Well, take Mr. Wythe. It's even worse for him in terms of this ratio of slave to free. He lives here in the city. There's only himself and his uh, dear wife Elizabeth. They have no children. Eighteen slaves. Nine to one. What's it going to be like for our grandchildren? Fourteen to one? Twenty to one? Dangerous. Our greatest fear has always been not the British Army or Navy, not the savages in the West, our greatest fear, our greatest danger has always been a successful and organized insurrection of our slave population. And that's why we have understood over these last 15 years, we've got to, enact, we've got to take a determined series of steps, compassionate steps, towards allowing the system of slavery to just die off. The first step we've finally been able to take now that we've been able to separate from Great Britain, that is we have ended the barbarous practice of the slave trade. No longer are these outlandish Africans being imported here to Virginia. And never again will they be. Point south they will, not here. That really is the most that we could hope to accomplish in our lifetimes. 
But I'm going to see the second step in that considered process in my life and here in Virginia. In six years from now, 1785, laws will be enacted whereby it will be not only legal, but rather easy for gentlemen to voluntarily free their own slaves at their own expense, provided, of course, those slaves they free will not become a burden upon society. Post a bond of 25 pounds on each head for each Negro you free in six years. I'll see the next step in that considered process in my life, though not in Virginia. In 1791, in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and the Republic of Vermont, not yet part of these United States, laws will be enacted whereby children born unto slaves will not be born as slaves, but rather will be born free, and thus might be learned to liberty and the responsibilities that come with being a productive member of society. Remember, friends, you cannot humanely expect a man who has lived all his life a slave to suddenly be able to shoulder those burdens. It's too much to ask. In 1793, there will be an invention. In 1793, an English traveler by the name of Boxley will be traveling extensively from New Hampshire to Georgia, all points in between, recording his observations into journals, which he then later publishes and sells. At several points throughout, he writes, I paraphrase, it's working. The American plan to allow the system of slavery to gradually die off is already showing some fruit. Here it is only 20 years after the Declaration of Independence, and already there are far fewer slaves than they, there were at the time of the American Revolution. Good for them. Alas, I pass on from this mortal plane in 1799. In 1803, that invention of 10 years prior will not only be perfected, it will be cheap, and it will be widely available. And for the first time in the history of the earth, the production of cotton will be a profitable business. And then, sir, all of our efforts will be undone. In, clo in closing, it would trouble me mightily were I to learn that some 230 years from now into the future, that there would be at least three school districts, public schools, two of them in New Jersey, and one in, of all places, North Carolina, who would determine that in the interests of promoting self-esteem, when they came to this particular period in the history, in the American history studies, they wouldn't even mention such names as Washington, Jefferson, or Henry, because those evil men were the owners of slaves. I might respectfully remind those school administrators of what becomes of a society that deliberately chooses to ignore its own history. I furthermore would point out that we are the first generation of men in the history of this earth to take very serious, very compassionate steps towards the, the gradual elimination of a most abominable institution. And for that we should certainly not be ignored nor scorned. We should be praised. In short, sir, let's first secure our own liberty and then we'll look to that of our fellow man. Huzzah.